Okay, I think uh, we are at the perfect time to start uh, our uh, um, webinar for the project uh, uh, about mapping uh, youth future, which is uh, a, an Italian uh, project uh, conducted in um, four by four university, uh, Milano uh, Bicocca, um, Cagliari, uh, uh, the University of Calabria, and uh, Napoli Federico II. Uh, it is uh, the third webinar of uh, of the series, uh, um, but in a way it is uh, also the fourth because the first seminar wasn't uh, uh, recorded, if I remember so. And uh, I am glad to introduce you Professor Adam Arvison, uh, which is our main speaker today, keynote speaker, let, let me say so, uh, Professor Mark Banks and uh, Professor Claudio Marciano, that we like as discussant to Adam. Before, uh, before to start, uh, I want to, to say that uh, this is not the, uh, absolutely is not the first of uh, uh, many in our uh, series <laughs> a, a, a webinar on, of only men. Uh, unfortunately, we try to uh, uh, have uh, with, our, uh, with uh, this debate, with uh, this meeting, also our uh, colleagues, uh, uh, women, uh, other colleagues, but uh, for uh, uh, personal and uh, working problems, they weren't able to participate. Uh, but uh, balancing uh, this uh, missing, uh, uh, you, you, can, uh, you, you can remember that for the first uh, seminars uh, of this series, uh, the prevalence of the discussant of the uh, keynote speakers were women. So uh, it's only a, a fortuitous case, this one. Then uh, I'd like to just uh, made a, a very brief presentation of uh, our guest, Professor Avar Arvison is a friend and uh, a colleague of mine uh, in our Department of uh, Social Sciences uh, in, in the University of Federico II, where he teaches uh, social, sociology of culture and communication. Uh, I, 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 I should say that uh, he, his uh, interest uh, has a wide range of research interests. Uh, at least I could, uh, I could also say uh, a, a bit hectic uh, related uh, to the cultural aspects of the changing and probably also challenging aspects of capitalism uh, today. Uh, uh, one uh, mm, of his book, uh, I think it is the, the last one, uh, it's called uh, Change Makers, uh, the Industrial Future of the Digital Economy, economy. and it, it has been published in 2019 by Polity Press and translated by Sosella in, uh, in Italian uh, in uh, the last year. Uh, then we have uh, Professor Mark Banks, uh, who is Professor of Cultural Economy at the University of Glasgow. And uh, I will quote from uh, his uh, profile, uh, uh, web website profile at the university, that uh, his current research is concerned with how the cultural industries and the wider creative economy can be made more socially and creatively just and better linked to ecological politics, especially through the ideas of post-growth, well-being or transitional economies. Um, also in, in this case, I, I don't know precisely if it is the, the, just the last one, but let me quote uh, his book, Creative Justice, Cultural Industries, Work and Inequality by Roman and Littlefield International. And then we have Claudio Marciano, uh, uh, who has uh, a, a postdoc position in uh, the University of Torino, and uh, he teaches at the University of uh, Valle di Aosta, Aosta's Valley, uh, where he teaches uh, sociology and uh, innovation policies, and uh, his uh, 
research and interest uh, covers diverse dimensions of social uh, innovation. And uh, also in this case, uh, I like to quote uh, his book, uh, uh, Smart City, uh, The Social uh, Sp Spaces of uh, Convergence. It, it is in Italian, uh, but I've, uh, I've try to translate, uh, I hope so, uh, properly the, the, the title. Uh, uh, after this, uh, I'll, uh, I'll let uh, um, our, uh, our guest uh, to, uh, to, to, to pin other tags on their chest by themselves in order to start our <laughs> debate. And uh, I'd like only to, to say that um, with uh, Juliana, Professor Juliana Mandic, that, that is uh, our principal investigator for the national project, uh, uh, we uh, have been very uh, glad that uh, Adam uh, um, was uh, interested in uh, presenting uh, uh, his uh, reflections about uh, the industriousness of uh, during uh, the capitalism of uh, nowadays. I think that uh, his book is very interesting because uh, he has tried a sort of very intriguing and interesting uh, comparison between uh, uh, the Puritan ethos, uh, ethos uh, uh, discussed by uh, Weber when uh, uh, Weber stressed how uh, the, the, the Puritans uh, was uh, very uh, stressed by the unpredictability of their future or the future of their souls, of their destiny. And then they have tried to practice a sort of uh, cultural presentism where the ikenunk of their professional commits, commitments was uh, a sort of uh, compensation uh, to this kind of uncertainty. Uh, now, nowadays, uh, um, uh, Adam in his book has, has tried to um, discuss this, uh, this, this new industrious, uh, industriousness uh, hitos, and uh, he has linked this uh, dimension of the nowadays capitalism to the issue of entrepreneurship. And uh, I should also say that uh, because uh, it is also, as we know, a, a main theme, a main issue of the um, neoliberal features uh, of, uh, of capitalism nowadays, uh, he is also very critical and he has stressed how uh, entrepreneurship uh, is uh, a sort of uh, competence competence instilled by various uh, uh, very, uh, institutions uh, such as the European Union, uh, but uh, mainly by the uh, school institution, educational institution uh, for young people. And uh, just let me finish uh, with this. Uh, it is very interesting how Adam stresses uh, mm, the, the way in which uh, uh, young people uh, mainly uh, try to practice uh, this kind uh, of uh, industrious, industrious uh, commitment uh, uh, to their uh, professional uh, practices, uh, stressing how they are also linked uh, to the existential project uh, of themselves uh, as uh, a way of uh, performing, I'm quoting uh, by his book, uh, um, performing uh, entrepreneurship as a way of coping and surviving, uh, preferring existential rewards uh, uh, to the material ones. Uh, ones. And so uh, I hope that uh, we will have uh, uh, time to discuss uh, after his presentation uh, with Adam and um, with Mark and, uh, and Claudio about uh, the, the future of, uh, of young people uh, in particular in the uh, changing times and, uh, um, of our capitalism society. So um, uh, I, I should say that because my connection is a bit weak, maybe that uh, I will stop the video, but uh, I, I'm, I will stay here for some, more, some minutes, let, let me say. It, it depends by, by the alerts uh, the website will, will send me. Uh, so, Adam, uh, thank you again for uh, 
your presentation today and uh, it's up to you about uh, 40 45 minutes okay thank you yes thank you thank you roberto for this excellent uh, introduction and thank you for the occasion to talk to all of you and i think the, the setup of the panel is is excellent because uh, both mark and claudio have been thinking about policy and policy implications and that's also something that i've been um, avoiding as much as possible. I remember one of the reviewers of the book when I, for policy, suggested that why don't you write a chapter on policy implications of all this? And I, I said, no, I don't want to do that. So, um, uh, but it's something that I'm beginning to get more and more interested in right now because I think that it might be time to, um, to actually say something along those lines, right? I mean, of course, um, it's always a little bit, um, um, it's always a little bit tricky to talk about policy because um, you know on the one hand you can always imagine how you would want things to be but uh, then being a sociologist you know that the obvious reason why things aren't as you want them to be is that someone else who wants things to be in another way actually has control over uh, the type of institutions and power mechanisms that matter etc right so it easily becomes a bit of a fruitless uh, exercise, but I, but I do think that it could be could be the time now because I mean if we people who actually do empirical research on cultural industries and digital innovation and all that stuff if we don't write about policy then we leave it to the um, uh, to the Paul Masons of this world uh, to articulate uh, pipe dreams that that then sort of uh, are more or less uh, real or not right so. So maybe something about policy could be interesting to to end up this session. Now, as to um, as to the book, it came out in 2019, so just before the COVID lockdown and everything, which sort of, in a certain sense, interrupted the uh, the presentations of it. So I feel like I'm still on the book presentation circuit, although they should have been like done and over with uh, by now for a long time. And and the book is essentially. Um, it's an attempt of, of sort of squeezing together two different strands of research in a sense. On the one hand, uh, research that I've been doing on, on creative industries and digital innovation and peer-to-peer -peer and startups and crypto economies and co-working spaces and all these different things of the, you know, related to what you could call the digital economy or the creative economy or, or, or whatever, right? And which has been going on for for about a decade now in different contexts. Most of it, a large, large chunk of it was done when I was at the University of Milano and we had a fairly big research center with people working on this, also financed in part by the, by the European Commission. Um, and the second part is like, um, you know, a, a fairly amateurish attempt in engaging in, in historical comparison, trying to sort of uh, find a, a different point of view as to how to reflect on and look at our present situation because um, in a certain sense, and that comes out a little bit out of a, uh, a maturing sort of discontent with most, um, you know, most progressive or, or sort of left-wing or critical narratives because um, there is a very strong sense in which um, sort of critical sociology and critical social sciences, but also radical politics um, tend to think about social transformation along the lines of the uh, post-1789 uh, large-scale revolutions of storming the Bastille or the Finland station and taking over the state, and, you know, movements growing up, uh, opposing the existing order and a certain point overthrowing it, etc. But um, for a number of reasons, I didn't really find that metaphor very, very suitable to, uh, to our times. And I thought a little bit about, you know, can you think differently about trans I discovered uh, the large literature and the transition from feudalism to capitalism uh, and, you know, found a number of parallels there that, I mean, the point is not so much. Yeah. Right. So market economy uh, for capitalism, at least in the state, if you, if you buy capitalism mean, um, a system founded on large discrepancies in the terms of the, of the concentration, right? So a capitalist market is a market where there are capitalists and a capitalist is someone who has a lot of capital. But if everybody more or less have the same amount of capital, then it's 
not really capitalist. At least that's the type of reasoning that I that I have, right? So pre-capitalist in the sense of not so much that they're not being sort of uh, acquisitive orientations or um, um, or desires to make a profit, etc. But pre-capitalist in the sense that the structure of the market has not yet developed sort of large power differentials in terms of market control and, and the concentration of capital. Um, and in, indeed, Marx said when he talked about pity production, he said that the pity producers or the pity indu industry, as he called it also, um, is marked by the fact that each worker possesses his own means of production. Um, and I think there's an important addition to make to that because um, one of the really important aspects of this type of industrious economy is not simply that it's made up of small, largely egalitarian market-oriented firms, but that those firms are also to a large extent relying on common resources. Um, and one of the reasons why they are sort of so um, capital poor, why they can be so capital poor, uh, is that there is a very rich reservoir of common resources that they can use, right? So this is true if you look at the 18th century craft economy that's growing um, throughout Northwestern Europe. Uh, these are sort of craft enterprises that are drawing on um, the common skills and the common knowledges that have been um, cemented and conserved within guilds and fraternities and other types of free capitalist structures um, and which now remain sort of commonly available for to be exploited in an entrepreneurial way. Um, it's also the type of uh, economy that, that, um, um, uh, that Charles Sable uh, and others uh, talk about as, um, as uh, uh, historical alternatives to mass production, essentially um, I mean, if you remember the Luddites, no, the Luddites, they weren't really so much against machines, they were against machines being used uh, in a non-artisanal way. So they were both standardization, mass production, and the lowering of quality and the transformation of lifestyles that followed with that. And they were defending instead a type of industrious economy built on uh, commonly available traditional skills, low capital intensity, and uh, fairly hierarchical or indeed sometimes even democratic systems of, of economic governance. Uh, so there's a strong component of, of sort of the commons uh, to this. Right? And, and this, I think, then applies pretty well also if you look at the ways in which the digital economy is going today, right? I mean, on the one hand, of course, you have um, the enormous concentrations of capital uh, within these big unicorns that have become the large scale players at the global level, uh, global Amazon, Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, um, Uber, um, and, and, and you all know these, these, these things, right? And these are, um, you know, companies that have extreme amounts of market power um, and that uh, are able to, uh, to build their position on essentially sitting on and controlling entire markets or even several markets at the same time, right? I mean, Amazon is essentially a, uh, a, um, a feudal structure, right? That, that taxes transactions on the, on the market infrastructure that they control, um, but that are also sort of um, staggeringly unproductive, right? I mean, one of the big paradoxes with the digital economy today um, is that as Robert Solow said in the 70s, in the 80s, you can see computers everywhere except in the productivity statistics, right? And we could say the same thing. We have smartphones and algorithms, and big data and all this stuff, but it doesn't seem to generate economic growth and, and, um, and employment, right? So, so there is a paradox in this sense, right? That you are, it is as if this, this uh, large scale um, digital capitalism has sort of doesn't really have a model for how to exploit the new productive relations that are emerging with, uh, with digital technologies. Um, and then on the other hand, of course, you have then a, a flourishing of these small scale, uh, labor intensive, industrious, uh, entrepreneurial digital companies, right? And, um, uh, or digital enter enterprises. 
Um, and I'd like to, uh, um, to split up this industrial sector in, in, in two parts. Um, and, and, and one of the parts is what I call the, the bourgeois part or the knowledge worker part, where you have essentially members of the global middle classes um, in the West, but also increasingly uh, in countries like India and China and Korea, etc., cetera, um, that are university educated, that have a fair amount of resources, maybe not so much economic resources, but social capital, cultural capital, etc. cetera. Um, but they find that um, these resources no longer sort of easily gives them access to the type of corporate careers that will guarantee, guarantee a sort of lifestyle, sustainable, a sustainable lifestyle, um, uh, buying a house, going on holidays, having a family, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, and at the same time, maybe they also don't really want that, right? Because there is a certain, there is both a pull and a push factor. And which one is which is, of course, very difficult to say because, you know, people might say they don't want to work in a large corporation, but that might be because they don't find a job in a large corporation and then they legitimize this in some way. But nevertheless, there's been sort of part of the, the middle class ethos in, in, um, in sort of uh, highly industrialized countries or, or uh, um, has been Sort of the, the dream of escaping the drudgery of corporate work, so the dream of escaping what David Graeber calls bullshit jobs, right? And going in and, and putting up something of your own that's more meaningful, that allows you to, um, to realize yourself, that allows you to feel that you're doing something, um, that you're sort of doing something progressive, that you're true to your values, etc. Uh, so that part, both sort of the people who are escaping and that are pushed out of the corporate economy and that can make recourse to these type of new common resources that have become ever more powerful right and ever more cheap right there are statistics that i cite in the book that say that uh, in, you know in the 2000s to launch a startup you needed about half a million dollars and today you can do it with about five thousand right so the costs of launching a startup have diminished about a hundredfold and there's a number of things that used to be very expensive 20 years ago, but which are now very cheap or basically free, like cloud storage or collaborative software or um, even targeted social solutions, designing a website, all of that sort of stuff, right? So there is a, a real sort of wealth in terms of uh, a new productive capacity that can be appropriated in this type of, in, in pursuing these type of industrious commons-based market-oriented enterprises. Um, and then there is the popular part, right, which is what I basically did, which is a very similar development, which is that you have people who are, uh, um, you know, attracted to the, the mirage of, of a global consumer modernity. Right? Probably never in the history of humanity has, you know, one single culture been so all-encompassing as consumer culture is today, right? We have about 5, 000, 5 billion smartphones being used across the world. And uh, on those screens, everybody sees the latest fashions and the latest t-shirts and the latest advertising and, and the influencers and, uh, and all of that stuff, right? So these are things that are not just circulating within people who are relatively privileged, but basically everyone has access to this stuff. And um, so there is a general sort of, um, Italian sociologist, uh, Francesco Alberoni, I think he took it from Merton, called it anticipatory socialization. He said that the, the migrants from Southern Italy who moved up to the North in the 60s, um, were partly they did it because they were poor, but mostly they did it because they'd already seen what life was like in the North on television, and they wanted to become factory workers and have modern kitchens rather than to remain in, 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 like, in the idiocy of rural life, as Marx would have put it. Um, which is probably not what you would say today. Today is probably the contrary. But, but anyways, uh, so there is a similar thing around a lot of people who are um, migrating and attracted to large cities of the South and also to take like the attempt to move up to Europe and to, uh, to the West, right? There's a brilliant article about um, Nigerian migrants to Italy that shows this very clearly that yes, these are people who are 
in living in different difficult conditions when there's not, not much of a future for them, uh, but they're also their main sort of decision to migrate comes from the fact that they're attracted to sort of trying their luck. It's an entrepreneurial project, a way of investing in yourself uh, to make the trip across the Mediterranean into Europe. Also, one has to remember that the people who actually do that are not the poorest and the most destitute. It's mostly the people who have a little bit of savings and, you know, larger than average cultural capital, uh, etc. Right? So, um, so there is definitely this pull factor, and then of course there is a push factor because um, you know uh, the, the transformations of the countryside in um, in Africa, Latin America, land grabbing, global warming, all these sorts of things are pushing uh, many many more people to migrate towards sort of the heartland of um, of modernity. Right? Then when they arrive, they find that there is no place for them within the employment structure of, in, of industrial modernity. I mean, the, large, the large factories in China, for example, used to hire anyone. Now they're not hiring so many people before because they're automated, right? Foxconn, as you probably know, the factory where they make iPhones and Playstations, etc., uh, is now the world's larger, largest buyer of industrial machinery and they're planning to, to, to replace about 10,000 jobs with robots just this year. So there is a diminishing demand for industrial uh, workforce, um, and there is a significant overshoot in terms of the availability of people coming in from from outside of the industrial areas. Um, but also here, there is a fairly well documented sort of um, refusal, right? Refusal to work. They used to say in Italy in the 70s, but um, you know. Chinese um, Shanzai entrepreneurs, people who develop sort of knockoff cell phones and street fashions, etc., are often people who've been working in these factories. Uh, but as soon as they could, they choose to set up their own shop at some point, right? As soon as they got a bit of money and some contacts, etc., because it's much better to be your own boss than to be a factory worker. Right? And it's a fairly uh, widespread sentiment also among, you know, there's this Italian anthropologist, Claudio Sopranzetti, who's been brilliant ethnography of uh, motorbike taxi drivers in Bangkok, who says exactly the same thing. These were people who came to the capital from the countryside to work in factories. Um, and then with the economic downturn uh, in the 2000s, they either got fired or they just didn't want to work in a factory anymore because it's understood to be humiliating. And, and uh, you know, it's much better to be, to be free, even though you earn less. Um, and, and it's more dangerous. So there is a common sort of entrepreneurial spirit that is uniting these bourgeois and popular industrious entrepreneurs, right? And it's a, something that's probably to a large extent, you know, maybe, you know, the closest to a global ideology that we have today, uh, which is like the idea that you should uh, invest in yourself, maximize your capacities, think positive, do everything you can with your life. Uh, if you just want it, you'll get it, etc. Right? This has been inculcated uh, in the new generations, um, new meaning probably many generations successive to mine, by a host of teachers and uh, social workers and self-help consultants and 12-step programs uh, and whatever you have. And it's also something that's not just sort of uh, influential in the West among the middle classes. It's also something that is very, very frequent and present in these type of more popular orientations, right? The widespread idea that um, Ghana, Ghana bus driver uh, entrepreneurs from Ghana uh, that I watched the documentary about who have these bus services where they drive people back and forth uh, in the city like collective taxis. They were, their account of their own life was completely imbued with this idea, probably also, you know, fairly well closely related to, to the type of evangelical Protestantism, which is very popular in certain African contexts. But the idea being that, you know, if you just believe in yourself and if you just invest in yourself, uh, then God will help you and you'll make it, right? This, of course, is the core also of the type of prosperity gospel, which is immensely popular at the margins of uh, prosperity, right? People who are close to, really can touch 
the dream of a global consumer society, but aren't quite there yet, right? Other people who tend to be attracted to these type of charismatic evangelical churches. So there is this sort of common glue in terms of what you could call neoliberal ideology of uh, the entrepreneurship of the self. Um, but I would say that um, it would be wrong to simply reduce this to sort of some sort of neoliberal indoctrination because um, the fact that it is so persuasive and the fact that it's so many people embrace it uh, also probably has to do with the fact that it somehow reflects their reality, right? It's, it reflects a reality that that is um, that it, that is in fact um, construed in that way, right? You are actually, uh, you know, it's it's a reality made up of of precarity, of no guarantees, of facing insecurity head on, etc. Right? And where there are no solutions and no truths and nothing to believe in anymore, right? A little bit like the the prodded rebels Protestants. Um, um, and, and an additional twist to this, of course, is that the fact that you, um, that this type of ideology of entrepreneurship becomes so widespread, of course, means also that a wide range of other political or ethical concerns can now be expressed in entrepreneurial ways. Right? So if you wanted to change the world, when I was young, you join a political movement. Uh, but there aren't hard, there hardly are any political movements around anymore, apart from the extremist ones. Um, so now you do it for enterprise instead, right? And you can sort of, um, there's been a significant sort of politicization of enterprise in that sense, right? So entrepreneurship is also increasingly becoming a way to, uh, to, to try to have an impact also above and beyond the economic goals of self-enrichment, self-betterment. Um, self So in a certain sense that we could say that there is a split um, in the digital economy today between an industrious sector uh, where most of the stuff is done, right? Um, most of the production of things or, um, is actually happening there, right? I mean, whether it's startups or innovations or, um, or um, simply you know, services, corporate services done by freelancers, communication campaigns, sales, etc., or whether it's experimentation with new technologies or radical forms of social organization, peer-to-peer, -peer, etc., or whether it's the growing pirate economy which is supplying uh, the hundreds of millions of people who have lift been lifted out of destitute poverty in countries like Nigeria or India, etc., but still can't afford the origins, the original stuff, or the kiosks where bored Bangalore night watchmen can download Bollywood films and watch on their smartphones during their night shifts or um, et cetera, et cetera, right? This whole stuff is essentially operating under these types of industrious conditions. So capital poor, commons-based, labor-intensive, market-oriented, and very, very low profit margins, right? Low earnings. This is something also that is that is that is common to this industrial sector. And indeed, what I think is that we're seeing a certain convergence between the proletarian and the middle class or the bourgeois part of the industrious economy, if nothing else, because productivity levels are converging in the sense that you actually don't make much more money launching a startup than driving a motorcycle taxi. Uh, you don't make much more money being a freelancer in the communication sector uh, than being a bazaar trader in, in knockoff uh, nights. Right? It's converging in that sense, at least according to what the economists call purchasing power parity. Um, and, um, and I think there's also an ideological convergence. Something that I'm really interested in right now is trying to understand uh, the no new type of popular bottom up certain sense industrious media that have developed in recent years TikTok, Twitch, um, gaming, all of these stuff which seems to be um, public spheres where in a certain sense um, this new industriousness both popular and, and, and bourgeois can somehow begin to uh, articulate its own public sphere and begin to sort of talk 
to each other. There's a wonderful um, video documentary online called Workers' Playtime, which is about TikTok during the, um, the, uh, the, the Indian lockdown, where, um, you know, as you probably know, millions of migrant workers were essentially forced to, to walk home. Um, some even walk, walked several hundred miles home, thus, of course, spreading COVID all over, over India. Um, as a response to Modi, the Modi government in lockdown. And, and that event gave rise to a, a ferment on TikTok with a whole series of sort of ways of telling and narrating these, these types of events. And, you know, um, I, I think that there is a sort of a, you know, the fact that already now you have an enormous amount of unemployed graduates, not only in Italy, but also in places like China and India, who are starting to work with the bazaar economy, with the pirate economy, with the Zanzai economy in China, in China, and and who are so you you have like people from popular origins and people from middle class origins starting to work together in this sense, right? And I think there's a really interesting potential um, for ferment in that sense, right? And something that then also brings up in a certain way the historical parallel, because what you could say is that you know. We're having a digital capitalism, which is becoming increasingly, I like to call it re-feudalized. Right? And that's actually not my expression. It's, I think it's Fernand Brodel's expression first, but anyway, Giovanni Arrighi took it up when he talked about the downturn of the Italian economy in the 16th and 17th centuries. So, so when sort of the, the center of economic activity in Europe shifted from the Mediterranean to Northern Europe, um, and then some of incredibly dynamic Italian trading houses, uh, you know, Florence, Pisa, Genoa, Venice, etc., with the possible exception of Venice, um, became increasingly organized around finance and financial capital, um, and less interested in productive innovations. And in, indeed, where there was like a considerable decline in the productive infrastructure, while at the same time an enormous amassing of financial wealth in the hands of a small number of, 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 uh, of very, very rich individuals. Um, and that led to um, a, you know, that type of phase tend to be um, not so much oriented towards productive investment, but more oriented towards consolidating wealth and conspicuous consumption. In this case, of course, it produced a renaissance. Um, in our case, it was mostly produces um, you know, rich kids on Instagram and, and people who order 20,000 euro bottles of champagne in nightclubs and stuff like that. But there's still a, a similar uh, type of, of, of dynamic. You have like com companies like Apple who has cash reserves that exceed anything in the history of capitalism worldwide. Apparently Apple is now sitting on around $250 billion of cash reserves, but they really don't know what to do with it. Right? They have no ideas for how to invest this stuff, uh, apart from making a new iPhone. Right? So, so there is a, seems to be like a similar type of, you know, um, immobility sort of in the higher echelons of the capitalist economy and a higher e e capitalist economy, which is mainly oriented towards acquiring and defending positions of market power that allows you to tax and extract rent from a wide range of productive activities that instead operate in the industrious mode, mode, right? So this is, of course, the way in which platform capitalism works, right? Amazon does not really produce anything, uh, but taxes transactions that happens on its platform, as does Uber, as does all of these other uh, other ones, right? So, um, so there is this type of, uh, of capitalism, which is increasingly following this type of rent-oriented feudal logic. And then on the other hand, you have this industrious economy, which is where you know, most of the actual value is being produced, um, and which right now is probably, I think, beginning to consolidate itself also in class terms, right? So in the same way as you could say that sometime between the 17th and the 18th century in Europe, there was the recomposition of something that you could start talking about as a bourgeois class, right? Comprising also you know, artisans and former members of guilds and fraternities, along with merchants, etc. Uh, something similar might also be happening right now, right? And and um, and, and I believe that you know, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the future? But but um, at least for the people who remain on Earth, right? I mean, it seems now that the main prospect on the part of 
large capitalist is leaving this earth and going to Mars or the moon or something. That's where the big investments are starting to go now in venture capital, etc. But for the ones of us who will inevitably be left on this planet and you know trying to live together in an ever more difficult and chaotic and precarious environment with climate change and heat waves and new pandemics and uh, resource scarcity and uh, food economy collapse and um, water shortages and, and whatever you want, right? Uh, this type of industrious economy will probably become more important to our livelihoods and more important also as a source of, uh, of innovation and of basically satisfaction of, of basic needs. If this industrious economy is also able to invent its own type of political structures, its own forms of organization and its own its own civil society, so to say, remains to be seen. But but to the extent that that's possible, uh, it might also harbor uh, seeds for um, some type of uh, of future version of of modernity. Uh, okay, I think that's that's basically it on my part. Now I think I. Um, I leave over to the uh, to questions. Thank you. Okay. I hope okay. you managed to hear something in the end. Yeah, uh, we've been uh, Adam. We've been struggling uh, just the uh, the first five uh, minutes, but uh, after that, uh, we were able uh, to listen uh, to your uh, interesting presentation. Uh, our, I. I I found uh, that uh, you have clearly showed us how wide and complex is the global scenario for young people in order to pursue their uh, uh, differentiated entrepreneurial paths to shape their future uh, works uh, and, uh, and their lives. And uh, also how the social, cultural and economic dimensions are very strictly intertwined between each other. Probably young people uh, clearly see they are quite aware of how their earnings will be low, low anyway in the most part of the cases. And this may be provoked to find for them to find other good reasons, Le Bon Raison uh, by Boudon, to perform their industriousness anyway. But uh, uh, it's time uh, to leave the floor uh, to Professor Mark Banks. And uh, I also wish to thank you for your role as discussant here. Thank you, Mark. OK, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Roberto, um, for your comments and your introduction, um, and to Juliana for the invitation to take part in this really exciting project. But most, of course, to Adam for a really excellent talk uh, fascinating um, ground covered and also to thank him for his book which uh, I found uh, really persuasive really engaging um, and I suppose what I take from it initially is that um, is we're being offered a kind of diagnosis really of the economic present but also a kind of future that's emerging so um, where we have a sense of uh, constant change but perhaps without a kind of clear direction, but, but also the furthering of the end of certain kinds of previous stable arrangements that we perhaps took for granted during the latter part of the 20th century. And I guess today what we're learning is that people are still working, uh, uh, however, um, but being industrious as Adam calls it. So they're striving to survive, uh, but without an anchoring in some kind of wider uh, purpose, if you like, be this a you know a higher purpose, as in the sense of say a you know a Protestant work ethic or some sense of deliverance in the afterlife, um, or even just a more earthly goal of trying to secure a stable career and a job for life and a, and continuous employment with all the status and the meaning that that once uh, provided. So, as I understand your idea of industriousness, Adam, um, it's distinct really from large industry, if you like, from uh, industrial modernity. What it's about really is a kind of day-to-day -day hustling uh, of small firms, of, it's about self-entrepreneurship, uh, petty commodity production in what's an increasingly kind of deregulated, uncertain and less socially secured situation. 
And I agree with what you say in that in the advanced capitalist societies, in European societies especially, um, the informal economy, uh, portfolio working, um, the gig economy and so on are really a kind of widespread and cross-class expression now of an insecurity that's long been experienced by working class and poorer people. Uh, and this has now migrated more into middle class lives as secure and stable professional and service work. You know, that kind of the work that was supposed to replace all that kind of dirty industrial work from the mid 20th century onwards um, and move labor into a sort of kind of cleaner, uh, kind of more socially mobile world. Uh, that kind of work now finds itself under threat from various kind of quarters. And I think you're right to identify the problems of economic stagnation, the fact that wages are kind of st static or lowering. Work has become much more insecure and intermittent. Automation threats are a problem. And of course, the whole scooping up of wealth by unproductive kind of financial capital, financialized capital, um, which we've seen happen much more rapidly since 2008. These are all kind of big problems. And, you know, that's not even mentioning the pandemic, which, of course, you know, is taking things in different direction. And I think what I take, I guess, from Adam's analysis is, is I suppose, a kind of semi-optimistic reading that this kind of steady accumulation of problems or kind of dysfunctional dysfunctionalities in capitalism will create a space for further waves of industriousness in some kind of way. And I, to me, that seemed a bit like um, quite resonant of Wolfgang Streak's arguments about capitalism, uh, not necessarily being overthrown by some kind of upsward, upsurge of revolutionary fervor, uh, but is much more likely just to kind of atrophy or collapse inwards or, you know, d suffer the death of a thousand blows or something. And I think the current stagnation and the economic impasse, I guess, is a, is a kind of catalyst, I think, for energizing new economic possibilities, new economic structures that might permit better or different forms of uh, uh, human flourishing uh, and survival for the many, especially for those being pretty ill served by the 1%. And to my mind, that really is one possible response. That is an outcome that might occur. Uh, so if people are forced back onto their own resources, then in some ways they have no choice to, but to take responsibility and create new circumstances for living, um, just as they did, uh, as Adam says, in, you know, in, in kind of post-feudal, early modern and kind of mercantile uh, societies. Uh, but I would say kind of semi-optimistic, and I think I would feel the same, uh, because I think it's recognized, of course, that there is a strong likelihood of violent resistance to any kind of progressive change from the established powers. That's what they do. Uh, and in fact, we see that already with um, kinds of hardline protectionist and suppressive policies from capital and its agents in various, particularly right wing governments. Um, so a strong resistance to ecological politics, a strong resistance to kind of welfare reform, and antagonism to migration of a, a, a certain kind and antagonism towards redistributive social policies and so on. So um, clearly there's, this is not gonna be an easy uh, transition. But what I find uh, most attractive and I think persuasive about the idea of industrious modernity is the obvious uh, tribute or validation it gives to human creativity and human agency. And this kind of social and cultural uh, ingenuity, I guess, uh, and industriousness is one that I would recognize as quite widely occurring in the fields uh, that I'm interested in, which is the arts and the cultural industries, and I suppose the broader kind of creative economy more generally. So here you can find plenty of examples of the kind of industriousness that Adam uh, talks about. Small firms, ethically and aesthetically motivated, um, concerned with subsistence as much as growth. Um, they tend to be profit satisficers rather than profit maximizers. Uh, they're not about kind of naked accumulation, if you like. Um, and many of them have their own kind of internal uh, or intrinsic justifications for taking part in economic uh, activity. And most of them, I guess, most people who work in the kind of arts and creative sector that I understand best are already kind of aesthetically engaged permanently or they're motivated by passion projects and so on. Um, and many understand work as the route to uh, meaning, 
the route to self-realization in various kinds of ways. Um, and, but of course, in the cultural sector, as, as you know, as noted, we find that uh, there are plenty of people who are forced to survive on very low pay, very low wages, or in entirely wageless occupations, right? Uh, people who, for good or ill, um, uh, understand their industriousness as being something that can barely enable them to subsist, um, but nonetheless has a kind of intrinsic or non-pecuniary reward at its heart, I suppose. Uh, yes, plenty of people who seek kind of meaning uh, first and recognition first and then wealth second, I suppose. And this is reminds me of, you know, Andrew Ross's writings about the mental labour problem that he wrote about in social text maybe 20 years ago, about this kind of constant kind of tension and dynamic between those, those kind of uh, motivations and forces. Um, so I find a lot of things to um, uh, like about Adam's uh, thesis and things I agree with um, um, uh, totally. Um, but I suppose as, as a respondent, I have to kind of raise some questions as well uh, of things that we need to think about otherwise. Um, um, so I've got a few points, not necessarily ones I have the answer to, but things that maybe the group would find interesting to kind of consider and think about. And I guess in no particular kind of order or prior, priority, the things that occurred to me were firstly, I suppose, I wondered what kind actually of political structures does um, industriousness require or perhaps anticipate might be a better word. So in particular, if we are to have an enhanced society of industriousness, does that mean there are social protections and insurances that will need to be provided for and guaranteed? So what kinds of collective social affordances might be necessary, I guess? So, of course, basically, is it some kind of UBI uh, or perhaps some combination of basic income and universal public services of some kind? Um, because without that, I guess, and otherwise, uh, industriousness or industrious modernity could start to look like a rapid race to the bottom in terms of resources and income distributions and so on. Um, I suppose the second thought I had was, can industrious modernity really have the same uh, relation to nature as previous rounds of industriousness from earlier modern periods? And I think Adam started to hint at this. Um, I would say that if industrial modernity tended to see nature, as we know, as a kind of externality, uh, something to be conquered and tamed and then exploited, for obvious reasons, we can't regard contemporary industriousness in, in those terms. Um, so I think it's interesting to think about where does industriousness stand in relation to problems of ecological crisis? So industriousness appears to be based on um, petty capitalism, but really also of a kind of unsustainable kind. And the ecological costs of industriousness are, of course, evident in accelerated extractions of minerals and metals for digital economy devices, as we know. So there's got to be more mining and then more energy use, more server farms and the vast energy resources used to run things like global blockchain systems and ledgers and so on. All those problems of e-waste, problems of plastics, habitat destruction, water quality and so on that Adam mentioned. So even if industriousness at a fundamental level is about petty commerce and petty commodity production, and even in some cases, of course, about recycling and subsistence, because that's one of the strong themes I think in Adam's book, um, it's still in some way an extractive and a resource intensive economy at a global scale, I think. So I'd say if industrious modernity is mostly uh, locally oriented and intrinsically motivated, if it's about looking in to the immediate task and circumstances in hand, then it might not necessarily be more kind of global and externally focused. So one question I had really was, who, who in industrious modernity is asking the big questions that we need to ask about the sustainability of the economy as a whole in, in this kind of new phase of modernity? Or, and are those questions even regarded as being uh, worth asking, I suppose, is my way of thinking about it. And this relates to a kind of broader um, issue, I suppose, which is um, what, what is really lying, I suppose, at the moral heart or the moral core of this new industriousness 
other than what appears to be the pursuit of a kind of an immediate and necessary striving for a kind of existential freedom or existential autonomy. Um, and if industriousness ends up being little more than a, a kind of an illusory sense of self-control at work, then is that something we, we really want to kind of celebrate? Um, um, and I think Adam sort of hinted at the idea that there might be an alternative to individual industriousness, something like collective industriousness or forms of collective contribution that are not simply about individual firms, but, uh, but, but have a kind of a wider social vision or potential. Um, so I wondered whether Adam or if anybody else who is um, participating today um, would see things like Extinction Rebellion or BLM or Me Too as, as somehow being examples of an emergent global industriousness or industriousness in a different kind of way. And I suppose my question really is, is do we think of industriousness um, as simply being a kind of mode of production? Uh, or is industriousness more of a social action, uh, action or a social relation or a kind of attitude that has a broader kind of purchase other than kind of commodity production? And I suppose the final thing I would just uh, ask uh, people to think about is whether or how industriousness sits in relation to uh, inequality. And as Adam identifies, a lot of this economy is not just um, uh, peer to peer, but, uh, you know, poor to poor kinds of interactions. Uh, but as Adam said, there is also a kind of growing convergence between working class and middle class in terms of economic opportunity um, uh, available. And this rise, I think, of uh, kind of hipster economies, uh, kind of artisanal economies, foodie and craft production in, in urban centers, that, you know, that kind of group who um, the sociologist uh, Bennett Berger first identified in the 60s as what he called bohemian businessmen, you know, long before David Brooks and Richard Florida came along, people had already identified this emergent class of kind of craft uh, bohemian entrepreneur. Those kind of people seem to me to be the expression of uh, the hollowing out of the traditional middle class career path, uh, professional kind of trajectory. And, and how, how you judge that? Um, well, on the one hand, you could see it as a sign of resourceful and creative entrepreneurship a response to a kind of a crisis in other parts of the economy. But it's also perhaps a sign of the increasing um, uh, bifurcation or splitting of social kind of class in the sense that only those at the very top of the social ladder or the social echelon uh, can now live in anything like a guaranteed security. And this is because I think, you know, as, as uh, Thomas Piketty and more recently sociologists like Lisa Atkins have identified, um, it is inheritance and the possession of secure assets like real estate and property and family capital and inherited wealth that is now the main source of kind of security and income growth and wealth. Uh, and it's this that's further kind of sedim sedimenting existing inequalities and social relations. So those, uh, those preceding European generations who for around uh, 30 or 40 years were led to believe that societies were were meritocratic and that wealth and security could be obtained by studying hard, going to university, um, getting qualified and then working your way up through the firm in a kind of a long career trajectory. That kind of implied social contract has kind of been torn up in front of people's eyes increasingly. Uh, so does that mean that those people both working and middle class people are condemned to struggle forever? Uh, are they condemn, condemned only to subsistence for the duration of their lives? Or does industriousness suggest the possibility of some other future for them? And I think this is what Adam was hinting at when he was starting to think about what's the, what's the politics here? Where, where, where is this leading us politically? And might these people who have had their kind of assumptions shattered in various kind of ways or their beliefs in the future uh, pulled from under them, um, might they reject actually industriousness as an idea? Might they start to question whether industriousness is the right path? Um, so my question, I suppose, 
or that I'm leading up to is um, what is the, what are the limits to industriousness in fact or what are the limits to thinking in terms of industriousness um, and I think I will just leave that as my final point to make and hand over uh, to Claudio and be interested to hear what people have to think about those things that I've just said. Okay, Mark, thank you for your uh, deep reflections uh, and uh, some critical uh, questions uh, to Adam. Um, I was thinking that uh, you started your uh, discussion by the constant changes and uh, it recorded me the idea of acceleration uh, by Helmut Rosa. And uh, also thinking uh, to the big questions uh, you were mentioning, such as uh, the one for a more sustainable development. Uh, I, I was th thinking, uh, I was uh, wondering uh, if the pandemic uh, uh, would produce a more accelerated society or we were assisting to a sort of uh, parenthesis of uh, social, uh, political uh, reflections about how could it be possible to start again also in terms of policies, uh, uh, maybe also in terms of uh, producing uh, optimism, uh, aptitudes uh, and, and, and so on. And so on. Uh, well, but uh, this is just a, a first way of reacting to your uh, uh, discussion. Uh, and now uh, we have uh, Professor Claudio Marciano. Uh, Claudio, it's up to you. Thank you, Roberto, and um, good evening to everybody. I'm very glad to be here and to give my little contribution to this very interesting debate. I appreciated the book of Adam, a change maker, but also I appreciated his uh, intervention today, so I will refer to both. But also I have to say that I appreciated the intervention of Mark uh, that uh, uh, proposed some questions to Adam that I uh, prepared before. And, um, uh, and then uh, that touched um, uh, different themes that I think are very interesting to explore. So I will spend just one minute to explain my, my research because there are many connections with the uh, research of Adam, in my opinion. Uh, the general topic of my research concerns the uh, social technical system of innovation. Uh, and uh, recently, I am very interested to focus, for obvious reasons, the uh, sectoral innovation system that uh, produced the anti-COVID vaccines, uh, uh, in particular in Western countries, in US and, and Europe. Uh, and in uh, particular, I'm focusing on the institutional processes that have influenced the uh, configuration of the uh, current global vaccine supply. Um, so, the uh, phenomenon that I'm studying uh, are very similar to the phenomenon that uh, Adam describes about the digital capitalism, even though we are talking about a different economic sector. Uh, for instance, I'm studying the impact of financialization of this kind of industry and the, uh, in particular the impact of this kind of process in the ability to produce in innovations and new drugs of this industry. In the last 20 years, we have produced less drugs than in the previous 20 years. And this is um, this, this STEM return also if we consider different uh, industries like artificial intelligence, where a lot of authors describe the paradox of productivity, you know, for which uh, uh, even though we are using artificial intelligence, we are facing a uh, decrease of uh, 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 productivity at least the productivity uh, understood as the uh, traditional meaning, uh, so added value uh, that um, economics, classic economics give to this uh, concept. Um, secondly, I'm studying um, the um, externalization processes, different kind of externalization processes that uh, uh, are very important in this industry, uh, at least at two level. The first one is the generation of idea, uh, so there is an externalization of the brain of the uh, vaccine industry. Uh, this is the reason why um, um, uh, we have big four, um, uh, big four uh, pro uh, producer of uh, uh, vaccines, but anyone produced a vaccine anti-COVID, just Pfizer. Yeah. Usually we have, uh, we discussed about big fives, now we have big fours. <laughs> big fours, yeah, definitely. <laughs> the big force, and there are GSK, Sanofi, I don't want to say this, but the, the, the most interesting thing is that the producer of 
vaccine uh, are uh, small uh, enterprises uh, like Moderna or BioNTech uh, or uh, um, uh, spin-off of the university like the Oxford vaccine. Uh, so we have an externalization that is a process that Adam described very well about the strategy of digital platform, but in this case of the brain, but at the same time of manufacture in uh, developed countries. And uh, in, uh, at the end, the, the role of the, uh, the, the public the, as a regulator on the one side, but also as a financier on the other side, uh, even though there is less be, uh, public values um, in comparison to the amount of money that uh, government gave to this uh, uh, kind of industry. So this is, these processes are very well described by Adam. And, uh, uh, in my opinion, are a trace that demonstrate how his work is important to understand uh, some dynamics of the contemporary capitalism, even though are not directly uh, implemented and used to interpret a specific kind of uh, uh, innovation sector. Uh, so he offers us uh, a, a conceptual framework to uh, um, interpret this kind of a phenomenon. And I appreciate also in his book and his intervention of today also uh, some reference to, um, uh, for instance, the uh, um, historical comparison with the pre-modern era and the contemporary days. Uh, I found very interesting his intervention uh, because uh, um, it is not easy to to see this kind of this attempt to make a comparison between uh, different era uh, so 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 far away between them and the idea to to use uh, the concept of uh, industries uh, to indicate uh, the configuration of new social groups uh, uh, that share not only uh, material condition but also cultural condition and uh, I, I would ask to Adam. This is the first question from him. If he uh, succeeded to see uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the trace of a social class, uh, if there are uh, the sharing not only of material condition, but also cultural value, I don't know if uh, political demand. Uh, then I, I really appreciate it also, the, the ability of Adam to describe some of these functionalities of capitalism. Um, for instance, in the, in the public debate, uh, Facebook, Uber, uh, Airbnb, Amazon are considered uh, big four, five, big five. Uh, and, and it's difficult to find someone that uh, is able to describe, for instance, the gap between the revenues of this multinational and the, their capitalization. So re their really value from a financial point of view. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the most important resources of his, uh, his book. Anyway, I, I want also to, to point out uh, something that I um, found problematic in his uh, proposal, and uh, in particular, three kind of uh, topics. Uh, the first one, and I'm repeating in a general way what Mark uh, already uh, said before, uh, the decline of capitalism. Uh, the, uh, the idea that capitalism is facing a crisis and probably uh, there will be a, a decline of this kind of system. Um, if I understand him correctly, Adam uh, um, predicts uh, sooner or later the digital capitalism will collapse uh, on itself because of the uh, impact of the ecological crisis, the absence of new spaces for new exploitation, so for new kind of uh, colonialism and uh, ongoing dysfunctionality of uh, and conflicts that are arising in the territory against, for instance, uh, digital platforms like Uber that uh, are um, in conflict with local interest. Um, but uh, I, 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 Adams use, uh, uh, Adams say also in this book that um, um, the research of new planets, for instance, uh, and at the same time, the ecological transition could be uh, two different means for new kind of space that capitalism could, uh, could uh, um, um, find to uh, regenerate its, uh, its cycle. But in my opinion, the two examples are not uh, properly at the same level. Uh, the, ex the exploration of new planets uh, definitely is something that is very incipient, but the 
uh, ecological transition, I think that is a theme that uh, deserve uh, more attention. Um, and in particular, I think that the ecological transition is a, um, is a strategic sector where uh, we are um, uh, observing already now the uh, new processes of regeneration of value by, uh, about, from the capitalism. Uh, on the one hand, uh, from a material point of view, so from a, an economic uh, point of view, through a new season of uh, uh, public debts that uh, um, will be probably a, a, a great injection of uh, uh, oxygen for multinationals and technology producers. Uh, and uh, even though they it can could create uh, good performances for everybody, um, this kind of uh, financing would be will be probably um, uh, have to be have to be compared with the possibility that uh, this kind of uh, technology producer give to politicians uh, for their strategy. Uh, and this is, I think, is a problem of cargo cult behavior that politicians and the politics in general has uh, in comparison to the technological development. Uh, so the, my question is for, uh, for, for Adam, um, if, uh, he, uh, if the te ecological transition um, can be considered uh, at the same manner of the exploitation of new planets or if can be uh, a, a phenomenon that have to be more ana analyzed with more attention uh, before to thought that think that uh, capitalism could be um, could afford a, 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 pe a period of decline uh, in next future and the second aspect consider uh, concern uh, the the social composition of the uh, industrious community that i called uh, uh, class um, uh, because uh, I really like the, the overview uh, of startuppers, uh, new peasants, uh, migrants that are able to open shops uh, in, the, in the foreign countries. Um, I really appreciate this kind of uh, storytelling. But actually, I found uh, some problems to consider this kind of population at the same level of riders, uh, of uh, Uber drivers, uh, um, uh, because uh, uh, an other kind of uh, um, urban post proletariat uh, people. So, uh, and the difference that I see immediately is that uh, uh, there is not the same investment in the desire uh, and in the, in the way in which the job is able to express uh, individual values. So my question is how uh, is possible to um, connect this kind, uh, this different kind of social actors in a common categories, uh, in a common sociological categories uh, that could be class or not. I am I'm proposing the concept of class, but I, I have to say that uh, Adam uh, doesn't use it, so uh, probably is just one uh, 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 is a question that is not correctly uh, proposed. But I, I I would like to know better uh, about the connection between these can, different kind of actors. The last thing that I want to say concerns the commons. Uh, here uh, as well, I, I found very interesting the. Uh, the reconstruction of the historical function of the commons in the pre-modern era, uh, and also the uh, recovery of the, of the Negri analysis uh, about the uh, reflexive effect of digital capitalism that uh, is able to create commons against its will. But I, I would like to know more about the uh, possibility uh, of these commons today for the industrious community, because uh, the example that uh, we are uh, um, observing in our, in our nowadays, in my opinion, are a little bit weak uh, in, the, in comparison to the debate, in comparison to the um, literature that uh, is studying this kind of process. For instance, in Italy, we had a big movement, social movement about uh, common goods in the uh, first years of this decade, last decade, uh, that was a referendum, but unfortunately we didn't see at the level that is very important of local public services uh, implementation, uh, serious implementation of this kind of uh, political site. Uh, so the transformation of this uh, 
concept in something that could be um, an alternative of public or private management of uh, public services or other kind of foundational element of economy. So this is our, the three kind of aspects that I would be uh, happy to explore with Adam and I, and I, and I finish it. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, also, uh, your reflections are very much interesting. Uh, I like mm, mostly the, 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 the beginning when you mentioned the role of Big Pharma during uh, this uh, uh, period of crisis. Uh, now, I'm, I'm proposing to uh, also because uh, <laughs> the time is uh, accelerating in a way <laughs> um, to give uh, Adam uh, uh, the possibility to answer to these uh, uh, questions from Mark and uh, and Claudio, uh, also a, a bit challenging uh, questions, and, and then I, I also propose to um, to ask uh, uh, the other participant to the seminar to uh, start uh, their questions uh, writing uh, on the on the chat uh, if they want to inter intervene uh, or uh, or they prefer that uh, i will uh, read their um, their answer uh, so sorry their questions <laughs> please adam okay thank you well, thank you very much, both Claudio and Mark, and these were very interesting and, and very um, difficult and complicated issues that you uh, that you uh, raised. I mean, in a certain sense, it feels like saying that you know, I don't know. I've I've just wrote this book. I don't have the answers to um, to everything, right? I mean, this concept of industriousness is just a it's just a small concept, and then once you write something like that, then people ask you to answer everything from cultural politics to environmental. Uh, policy and all this kind of stuff, right? So I really don't have, I really don't have a clue about a lot of it. I mean, I just wanted to maybe clarify a couple of things. So um, I wrote in the intro to the book very clearly, I wrote, this is not an optimistic book, I wrote, but um, it doesn't seem to really matter what you write. Everybody thinks that it's an optimistic book anyways, right? Because I think as soon as you're not like, uh, you know, completely uh, capitalist, realist, and pessimist, then everybody thinks that you have some sort of optimism to sell, right? And um, I don't really know, I mean, as I think both of you have pointed out, I mean, I'm a quite ambivalent in terms of that, right? I mean, I'm not proposing either, you know, the simple end of capitalism replaced by community organized industrialists in some way, right? I mean, I do think that capitalism has a very long future, just like it has a very long past, right? It'll go on until the last uh, ton of fossil fuel has been burned to ashes, as as Max Weber said, and maybe even even longer than that. Um, the question is, of course, in what form? Right? Because you can very much imagine a type of capitalism that continues on this, you know, what we want to call it, refeudalized or um, elitarian or, or restricted um, range, right? Essentially creating a society made up of smart cities and maybe space colonies and, you know, and a diminishing corporate um, capitalist class that you know, goes on consuming uh, their sushi as if nothing has happened um, in, you know, in isolated protected islands in this great planet of slums where everybody else is dwelling, right? And I think to some extent, the, the pandemic gave us a little bit of a view of that. I'm, I'm thinking about a new book now, which is it's called tentatively Living Together in the Anthropocene, where I'm trying to look at the, you know, not to write about COVID because I don't know about that and everybody doesn't know much about it, but just say a little bit of this experience of the pandemic, I think highlighted a number of ways in which we can face insecurity, right? And one of those ways, of course, is the official pandemic response, which essentially is, is this, right? It's isolate yourself from insecurity and try to create bubbles of predictability or at least calculability uh, around a, a type of lifestyle which is fairly continuous with, with what is sort of established um, capitalist, modernist lifestyle. And I'm sure that can continue, right? And then you can keep all these slum dwellers at bay in some way, right? Um, 
I mean, I think outside of this type of, um, you know, uh, secluded and, and securitized space of a capitalist future, industriousness is probably going to be important for the people who are left outside of that, right? And maybe you can think about scenarios similar to people like Abu Malik Simon, et cetera, who write about cities like Jakarta or Lagos or, or Bangkok, et cetera, as really never emerging out of this type of condition, right? I mean, to some extent also Naples is, is like that, right? There is a certain, you know, a very strict divide between on the one hand a, you know, a fairly modern and a fairly a well-off and, and international bourgeoisie. And on the other hand, there'll be the level of the people, which is sort of basically eternal in its, its sort of continuous uh, struggle for an everyday getting by in a certain sense. Right? There is this famous historian Galasso who talks about the, the relationship between the, the bourgeoisie and the people in Naples is that the, the Napolitanian bourgeoisie is like the Cozza sulla roccia. It's like the, it's like the clam on the rock, right? So it lives in this type of different, different world. In a sense, right? so, um, the so muscle, I mean, more huh? than the clam. The, the muscle, more than the, the muscle, clam. Yeah, man, the <laughs> muscle, muscle on yeah. the rock. Yes, yeah. Um, so, yes, there's a gastronomic distinction there. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so that that I mean, I I would think that. You know, the scenario for industriousness could be basically just that, you know, to put it in very simple terms, the capitalists go into space and we're left in a global Lagos where we have to try to sort of fend for ourselves through this type of industrious relations, right? But then on the other hand, it's also possible, as both of you mentioned, and I have no idea really how, well, I mean, it's not that I don't have any idea because there's a lot of ideas around, but which one of these ideas will eventually be efficient, I think is very difficult to say you know, that this type of industrious economy also um, achieves some sort of political or economic self-organization and starts building its own institutions or movements or ideas and things like that. And what that's going to be, I think it's very, very, very uh, difficult to say because it's a very politically ambivalent phenomenon in the sense that on the one hand, of course, this industrial economy, industrious economy is ripe with initiatives for, you know, often fairly fantastic forms of radical social organization. Right? I mean, if you look at the blockchain sector, everybody has a white paper where they say that blockchains is gonna solve the problem of sustainability or transparency for supply chains, or someone even proposed a project where they were gonna give everybody capital at zero interest, which in a financial economy equals communism, I think. So, um, so that's that's all there, right? But then in reality, you could see also how, I mean, the industrious economy is the main subject behind Trumpism, for example, right? The people who vote for Trump in the US are not the destitute poor, it's the small scale entrepreneurs, the people who have, you know, cleaning firms or secondhand car sales or logistics firms, or, you know, the type of small scale industrious entrepreneurs that have, grown massively in the US as they have in Italy uh, as a consequence of those sort of destruction, exactly the same type of development that I described in the book, but are tend to go towards the political right, right in this sense. Also in Italy, the Lega Nord is very much an expression of this type of industrious turn, right? So, uh, you know, that's another direction that might, might very well, I mean, that might very well be that we find some sort of, you know, emerging uh, solid, um, right-wing proposal that is able to mobilize a lot of these actors, right? I mean, also um, people I know have been doing field work in India. They say that, you know, these type of bazaar vendors that I discussed in the book, they're all pro-Modi, right? They're all pro the sort of BGP, uh, or well, they were at least until COVID. And then after that, maybe things have changed now given the total disaster that the management of COVID has been in India. But, but, but still, right? So there's a um, there's no reason that this is any way going in any sort of progressive direction at all, right? Um, and and I think those questions there they're simply too too uh, it's simply too early to to answer that. I mean, at least I, I don't have any sort of answers uh, in relation to it. And then of course the issue is also that that Mark raised, I think, in terms of um, 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 the uh, 
uh, or, um, or or also I think Claudio also in terms of uh, space expansion and, and ecological transition and all these things, right? I mean, I, it's very difficult to say there too. I think, right? I mean, I mean, definitely, I I mean, capitalism needs a new uh, a new a new fix, right? Today, David Harvey it needs a new regime of regulation. It needs something that can open up new markets for continued expansion because. Staying with 21st, 20th century consumer society isn't just going to work. I mean, you're going to improve the efficiency of pizza delivery and taxi rides, but it's not going to create any value for, for anyone, really. So, so what are those options, right? I mean, of course, space expansion is something, and I think that's quite likely. You know, I think it's probably more likely to see, we're more likely to see, uh, you know, lunar settlements than some sort of serious global policy for, uh, resilience and climate change. But but at a certain point that will also become necessary, right? Because you need, as Mark Shoram pointed out, you need to guarantee some way the infrastructure around things, right? Um, and, and how are you going to do that also, right? In this and how are you going to do that in relation to not only an industrial but also an industrious economy to me is, is very, very open ended. I mean if you look at the the historical parallel, of course and this is obviously something I don't really mention in the book, I guess I should have, but um, is that, well, the industrious expansion in Europe in the, um, in the 18th century uh, and early night was of course intrinsically linked to colonialism as well, right? I mean, it would be impossible to think of this possibility of a market-driven economy if you didn't have these type of you know, non-market, uh, essentially, you know, plantation economy, working on the sides and supplying the cheap calories and the cheap raw materials for this sort of stuff, right? So not only industrialization, but also the preceding industrious revolution was to some extent piggybacking on this, right? So if you think about, if you're gonna have an industrious prosperity, you know, a sort of something similar because in, in you know, in, in, the, in you know, Okay, so in the book, I, I trace this European industrial revolution back to the crisis of feudalism in the 14th century and the black, uh, the, 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 the plague and, and the black death, et cetera, which of course has a lot of parallels also with the ecological disaster of the Anthropocene, et cetera, right? But, you know, then it, point, it, it, it went, because of the possibility of global expansion, this thing went in a progressive direction, right? It created economic growth and above all, political and cultural development. You got like the development of new political institutions, European civil society, ideology, ideology of liberalism, uh, enlightenment and all that sort of stuff, right? But it, you know, it could also have gone the other way, right? It could also have gone towards pro prolonged stagnation uh, in, in um, you know, um, and let's see what way it goes now, right? I mean, I think if, you know, the way in which prolonged stagnation could look like, I think, is quite obvious to all of us because we're seeing it around us everywhere, right? I mean, there are a lot of places around the world where, where the disaster has already happened, so to say, right? Um, but the, what could, and you know, what, what might an industrious prosperity look like uh, is, I think, an incredibly difficult question and, and one that also needs to be solved in practice more than through theoretical speculation, I think. I think it's up to the very movements and actors to, to elaborate these sorts of things. But of course, one obvious parallel that strikes you is that, you know, if, if there was slave labor essentially to, uh, to, uh, to create the conditions for this in the 18th and 19th centuries, well, today automation would be, you know, you would think that automation could somehow be used in that, that way, right? But, but how to achieve that and, how I, I have I have really no idea. Um, yeah. So I wanted to launch a research project on this on policy, industrious policy. But um, I think indeed we need a lot of research in order to to be able to start to say something about it. Well, thank you, Adam. Uh, this is a very stimulating uh, idea of, of a new project. Uh, and so I. I would like to thank you all uh, for this uh, debate. Uh, 
I was thinking about uh, uh, what Mac, Mark uh, mentioned as the aesthetic uh, of, of life. Uh, so uh, probably instead of thinking of optimism in terms of uh, merely attitudes or values, uh, we should look uh, uh, also at the practices of young people uh, in the present and for their futures. For example, studying uh, young entrepreneurs uh, uh, win, uh, with uh, other colleagues, uh, Antonella, um, uh, Lia, Sandra, uh, we are witnessing uh, how uh, the aesthetics of their life is almost a very, uh, there is a, a close connection between the aesthetics and their their ethic uh, uh, industriousness uh, and uh, so I think uh, we could try to um, be more uh, uh, proximal in a way to this kind of, of their uh, existence. Uh, uh, so I, I wish to thank you all. There is also a, 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 a great thank you from uh, Juliana. And uh, I hope that uh, there will be a, a, another chance to discuss together. Uh, uh, le let's hope uh, we in an optimistic way, uh, maybe lively in instead of online. <laughs> maybe in Glasgow or on Naples or somewhere else. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Claudio, for. Uh, Thank your you. insightful uh, thank you very much thanks thanks for everybody to uh take yep. the time thank you that was great bye thank bye. you bye bye, bye.